Hello, welcome to this pro program of the Jesus is Life Ministry. My name is David Oyster. Thank you for tuning in today. Last week, last week I began a series of programs on Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. In last week's program, I provided an introduction to the epistle and then talked about chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 in some detail. Today, we will look at chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. If you have a Bible handy, please open it to Ephesians chapter 1. In this letter, Paul presents God's eternal purpose for his creation through the redemption by Jesus Christ and the essential part the church has in God's plan. Paul also teaches about the work of the Holy Spirit, the believer's life of victory in Jesus, and the union that all believers have with Christ and with every other believer. If you heard last week's program, then you recall that this letter is thought to have been a circular letter to all the churches in the Roman province of Asia, that is, in what is now the western part of the country of Turkey. Verses 3 through 14 of chapter 1 are all one sentence in the Greek, as Paul wrote it, Last week I went ahead and talked about verse 3 because of its close relation to verse 2. In verse 2, Paul greeted the saints in the churches with the usual Greek style of greeting, and in verse 3, Paul used the usual Jewish form of blessing. As we see in chapter 2, Paul was very interested in the unity of Jewish and Gentile believers in Jesus. And in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1, Paul showed that the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers in the cities of Asia that they were all included in the saints he addressed in verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, let's read verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. As I mentioned, verse 3 follows the ancient Hebrew form of giving thanks. To thank God for something, God is praised for blessing his people with it. Here Paul praises God for blessing believers in Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In verses 4 through 14, Paul lists a number of those blessings. Every spiritual blessing includes all that we have in Christ all that the Holy Spirit brought to our lives the moment we received Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. The Apostle Peter wrote in his second epistle, chapter 1, verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. That's right, God has provided us everything we need to live as he wants us to. These are ours now. We experience them in our daily living as we rely on the Holy Spirit by faith. This phrase, in the heavenly places, occurs only in Ephesians and is found five times in this letter. The heavenly places are the realm where Christ has been exalted to the right hand of the Father. Believers in Christ are united with him and spiritually are already with him in the heavens. We are at the same time in both the physical realm and the heavenly realm. And we are to demonstrate that Jesus dwells in us and that we are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live out what Jesus has done within us. In verse 4, we see that God's choice of those in Christ was before the world was created. There is an unexplainable mystery of how God's sovereign choice and human free will work together. I believe that what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 to 30 helps us understand to a degree there Paul wrote, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the, to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Note that those whom God foreknew, he predestined to eternal life. God is all-knowing. Before he created the earth, he already knew everything that everyone would ever do throughout human history. We know that God created us humans with free will. We know this because we sin, and God does not cause anyone to sin. We choose to sin with our own free will. Only an all-knowing and all-powerful God can know everything beforehand without causing everything. 
Of course, I'm sharing with you my interpretation of Romans 8, verse 29. There are differences of opinion on that verse. Each of us has to pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us into God's truth. That there are differences of opinion among those who sincerely seek God's truth demonstrates that none of us listens to the Holy Spirit perfectly. We all need the corrective influence of the body of believers, the church, as we strive to hear God's truth revealed to us. As verse 4 says, God's purpose in choosing us is that we should be holy and blameless before him. The moment we received Jesus as our Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit came to dwell in us, and in that moment he gave us eternal life. He also created new selves within us, and those new selves have God's righteous character. God also forgave all of our sins so that we are blameless before him. Because of our weakness, we still allow our old nature, our old sin nature, to influence us, and we sin. We can grow in righteousness as we experience the work of the Holy Spirit in us, but we will not experience complete victory over sin until we go to be with the Lord. Well, let's read verses 5 and 6. The words in love at the end of verse 4 should begin verse 5. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely be bestowed on us in the beloved. God's motivation for choosing us was his love. As John 3 verse 16 says, God's motivation for sending Jesus to be our Savior was his love. As Paul wrote here, God adopted us according to the kind intention of his will. John 1 verse 12 says, As many as received Jesus, God gave to them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Not everyone is a child of God. Only those who have received Jesus by faith have been given the right to be God's children. Our being adopted as God's children through Jesus means each of us now has a personal love relationship with God. With our adoption, we also have privileges and responsibilities. We are not merely saved for heaven and delivered from hell. As Paul said in verse 6, our becoming God's children is to the praise of the glory of his grace. God desires that we grow in being like Jesus, I think, for two main reasons. One, the closer we grow to Jesus, the more we enjoy our love relationship with God. And two, the more like Jesus we are, the more we experience the Holy Spirit working through us to glorify God so that others come to know God through Jesus Christ. In the second half of this letter, Paul wrote practical ways we are to live out the characteristics of God's goodness and love that he created within us. Here in verse 6, Paul's writing, to the praise of the glory of his grace, emphasizes the supreme majesty of God's grace. God's grace is his working in our lives as an undeserved gift of his love. And God has freely poured out his grace on us. Picture God bountifully throwing more and more of his grace on us. God is continually working in our lives as an undeserved gift. We cannot earn or merit anything that God gives us or does in our lives. We receive his grace by faith, and only through the beloved, God's only begotten Son, Jesus. Let's continue reading with verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. The word redemption means being freed by payment. Our redemption through Jesus has to do with our being freed from sin by Jesus paying the death penalty for our sin when he died on a Roman cross. Because Jesus paid our penalty for us, God can forgive all of our sin. Paul wrote that it is by our being in Christ that we have received these gifts of God's grace. Believers are in Christ because Jesus dwells in us. We have been reconciled to God by Jesus. Our sin caused our death, our separation from God, and because Jesus took our sin away, there is now nothing in the way of our having a relationship with God. And Jesus can now dwell in us, and we are in him. By his dwelling in us, we have Jesus' life in us, his resurrection life. And we have eternal life. And this means not only life that extends to the future forever, 
but also includes the quality of Jesus' life. His goodness and love are ours. And this redemption and eternal life are ours because God has lavished his grace on us. The immeasurable abundance of God's grace is made possible by the immeasurable costliness of Jesus' suffering and death. Continuing with the last part of verse 8 through verse 10. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure and his purpose in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. The wisdom and insight here are gifts of God to his people by his grace so that we can understand God's revelation his cosmic purpose, and our place in his plan. A mystery in the New Testament is something that was hidden but has now been made known. Paul speaks of God's purpose for his whole creation that he planned to be for the creation and is fulfilling through Jesus Christ. He has made known his purpose to his people. His purpose is according to his good pleasure, grown out of his love. God is working out his plan in time, and it will be completed at an appointed time when his kingdom will come to full manifestation at our resurrection when Jesus comes again. Note here that God's purpose is not limited to man's salvation, but includes all things in the spiritual realm and in the physical creation. All will be in a completely new and perfect order with Christ as the universally acknowledged ruler. There will be complete harmony, love, goodness and unity in Christ. It will be so wonderful that our very limited minds cannot fathom it. Verses 11 and 12 continue Paul's list of blessings we have in Jesus Christ. The words in him at the end of verse 10 belong to the first clause of verse 11. In him, that is in Christ, we were chosen as his inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In Christ we have been made God's inheritance. Paul is thinking of God's own possession, which we find in verse 14, and God's inheritance in the saints, which we find in verse 18. Believers in Christ are God's heritage through the redeeming work of Jesus. We have been included in the ranks of God's chosen people. Again, Paul says that our inclusion in God's people, in Christ, is by God's choice before the creation. It was God's purpose, and what God has purposed, he brings to fulfillment. God's wisdom, love, and power combine to work for the accomplishment of what he has planned. In Paul's letter to the church in Rome, he tried to explain God's predestination. In that letter, he also made room for human free will. Again, how God's sovereign will and human free will work together is still a mystery. We know, though, that God can work through everything, even sin and evil, to bring about his good purposes. Whatever we think of predestination, God's own glory is displayed in all that he does. In verse 6, Paul wrote that the predestination of believers to adoption as God's children displays the glory of God's grace. And here in verse 12, the foreordination of believers to be God's special heritage results in his glory shining in them with the whole universe seeing that and praising God. In verses 13 and 14, Paul concludes his sentence that lists blessings believers in Jesus have been given with the gift of the Holy Spirit. These verses read, In him, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were also sealed with a promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The word gospel means good news. This good news is truth. It comes from the God of truth. In him there is no falsehood. There is no truth for one person and a different truth for someone else. In God is absolute truth and his truth is above all the opinions of others. Paul makes clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that humans cannot know God's truth on their own, but have to receive God's truth by revelation. God has made his truth known through the writing of the Bible, 
Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21, that the writing of the Scriptures was not according to the writer's own thinking, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The good news is of our salvation, our being reconciled to God and receiving eternal life with God through Jesus' death and resurrection. Here in verse 13, Paul says that those who have come to believe God's truth in the gospel have been sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit. A seal signifies ownership. That believers are given the Holy Spirit is the sign that they belong to God. They have been included in God's heritage, his people. Sealed in Christ means they share in his resurrection life. The construction in the Greek indicates that the sealing by the Holy Spirit happened at the moment of their believing. They have been incorporated into living fellowship with God and with God's people. In verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the down payment that pledges our final redemption at Jesus' second coming. He is the guarantee that we have eternal life and will experience it in its fullness at the resurrection. God's inheritance made up of all believers of all time will be delivered in full, and the praise of his glory will be complete when the, when the whole universe and all that is in it will praise and glorify God for his marvelous and great purpose which he has accomplished in Jesus Christ. We see in verses 3 through 14 an overview of what we who believe in Jesus have from God by his grace. We see God's cosmic plan that involves the whole universe. His plan began before the creation. It is fulfilled in Jesus Christ through his death and resurrection. And God's plan includes our coming to faith in Jesus, our life in Christ, and our resurrection at the end of the age, when everything in heaven and in the physical universe will experience total wholeness in Christ. All of this, as Paul stated three times in these verses, is to the praise of God's glory. God does not want the glory and praise of the whole universe for his own benefit. He is not self-centered. God is love, and his love is self-giving. God wants his glory to shine through all of his children and all of his works, so that everyone in heaven and on earth throughout all time will know that he is life, he is love, and he is good. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that God does not wish any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God desires for all persons to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is why God wants us to be to the praise of his glory, so that others will come to know him and receive life through Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Well, next week we will continue in the book of Ephesians and we'll pick up at chapter 1, verse 15. Well, this is David Oyster with the Jesus is Life ministry here on WDSG Radio, Sanford, North Carolina. Thank you for listening today.